That carrot crunch is so loud. I don't think it's loud enough to get picked up on the mic. How many carrots you got left? Four. Okay. That's good intro material though. Thank you. Hey everyone, how's it going? Doug here and we're back with chapter seven of our Let's Read of Archangel. I um, hope everyone's staying home and staying safe if you have to be outside. I hope you're taking extra precautions and sticking to that two meters apart. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I am giving away a free copy or free copies of Archangel in ebook form on my website to encourage people to stay inside and maintain that social distancing. I'll drop a link to that in the description down below. But today we're reading through chapter seven, uh, continuing off from when Uriel and Chandra found Sanctuary, which was the hideout of angels living under Bodice's city, Zezerat. Uh, they got kind of the lay of the land, they got to relax a little, and now they're going to investigate the city so that Uriel has a better sense of what's going on before they launch into action. So without further ado, let's get started. Finding their way to the streets was not as easy as Raphael made it seem. Uriel felt like they had gone in circles within circles, each turn revealing a tunnel or wall that looked to be just like every other one. Chandra commented more than once that she did not recognize where they were, and that she had no idea so many tunnels were running underneath the city. Each comment affirmed that Sanctuary was well hidden. It would be nearly impossible to find your way in or out of the shelter if you did not already know it. The pair quickly found that many people, mostly those plagued with disease, counted on just that. The sewers were littered with corpses and those who would soon join their ranks, each of them a person who had wandered down there to wither away. The smell of their decaying flesh mingled with and exacerbated the stench that was already thick in the air. Uriel was horrified as he witnessed the diseases that were, in many cases, literally eating away at the humans that lived in Zezerat. The first man that they came across, at least the first that was still living, was unnaturally bloated. It was as if his body had been submerged in water for weeks. His skin was slimy and colorless, except for thick, gray-blue veins that crawled across it. Uriel thought the man dead until he made a sickening gurgle as they passed him. Moments later, Uriel's hand shot out and grabbed Chandra by the shoulder, sobbing the cambion in her tracks. Up ahead, the archangel saw a figure crouching in the corner, trembling. Please, make it stop. A hushed voice whimpered. It hurts so much. Get it out, please. The figure turned, forcing the companions to avert their eyes from the sad creature before them. The woman, barely an adult, was naked save for the dirt and blood that caked her body. She had not been attacked, yet the blood was her own. Uriel could not help but watch as she relentlessly raked at her skin, tearing away flesh as she dug at something that was not there. Her entire body was a canvas of scars and fresh wounds, some of them yellowed with infection. Some of her fingers were missing their nails. Uriel grimaced when he noticed one of them protruding from her arm, the flesh having grown back around most of it. One of her eyes seemed twice the size of the other, the tissue around it long since torn away by the poor woman's scratching. Is there nothing we can do? Uriel was almost pleading with the half-demon. He knew that, of the two of them, only he possessed any sort of healing ability. He already knew, though, that this woman was too far gone for his power to have any real effect. The plagued human crawled over to the archangel and gripped onto his legs. You're so warm, the woman said, looking at him with eyes that, while begging for mercy, still seemed very much aware of their surroundings. It pained the angel to think that she was conscious of her suffering, not just a body wasting away like so many of the others. Please, don't leave. Chandra, behind the poor creature, quickly wrapped her hands around the woman's head and broke her neck with a twist. Nothing the cambion said resolutely. Uriel could feel his heart follow the lifeless body to the damp, fetid ground. He had witnessed suffering and disease before. He had watched as the Black Death ravaged the old European countries to a third of their former size. But that had been one disease, one random evolution of a single bacterium. This pain, this horror, was something much worse, and this realization shook Uriel to his core. So it went. The pair made their way through the sewer, stumbling upon men and women whose suffering Chandra ended at the tip of a dagger or the break of a neck. Uriel struggled to accept that the Cambion was only seven years old, a mere child by human standards. It appeared that both her demonic blood and the ways of this new world had caused her to mature as quickly as her physical form had. The half-demon had survived and cared for her sister, had witnessed atrocities and bore burdens that Uriel could only imagine. He could see the crimson of her eyes, but each time she killed one of the sick it was out of mercy, not some sadistic lust. She was a half-demon, but already she had proven that she was much more than that. Here we are. Uriel said as the pair came to a set of stairs. The steps began at the end of one of the tunnels, terminating in a door that lay flush with the ceiling. Raphael told them that the door led to an abandoned building in the slums. They would be far enough away from the markets and upper districts, but also a safe distance from the territory claimed by the gang leader, Switchblade. 
a name that Uriel had heard more than once already from the other angels. Raphael warned them to stay away from the human who ruled the slums under the blessing or indifference of Bodis. Chandra had muttered something about the man, though Uriel missed it. From her tone and look of disgust, he inferred that it was not a pleasant statement. Uriel flipped up the hood of his cloak his brother had given him before they left. It was lighter than his duster, but less conspicuous. It had the added benefit of shadowing his face and covering his arms. It would hide his tattoos and, most importantly, the gleaming halo around his neck. If anything were to give him away as a warrior of heaven, that would be it. The archangel led the way up the stairs, lifting the heavy wooden door just enough for him to scan for threats on the other side. Raphael told them that sometimes the homeless would squat in the building. While most of them were not violent, those who had contracted one of the various diseases might be paranoid or delusional enough to attack. But the building, Uriel saw once his eyes adjusted from the near darkness of the sewers, was devoid of any life aside from a cluster of insects that buzzed towards the smell of the sewer. The archangel pushed the door open, being careful not to make any noise. We carry the stench of waste with us, the angel complained to his companion as they moved into the small storehouse. He brushed at his clothes and skin, as if trying to wipe the smell away. After the luxury of being able to bathe in sanctuary, it felt like a second skin had been laid on him, comprised of all the things in the sewers that he did not want to think about. The building was some sort of storage facility. Broken crates and boxes were stacked atop one another or strewn across the floor. It was evident that the place had been looted, though the thick dust that covered the room led Uriel to believe that it had gone untouched for months. Won't the smells of the sewer give away our presence? The whole city reeks of shit and piss, Chandra muttered as she did a quick sweep of the building, searching to see if looters had missed anything. To her frustration, they hadn't. The windows of the structure were all boarded up, but the door was not barricaded at all. A large iron bolt locked the door from their side, but it slid away easily. Here, this should take us out onto the streets. I'll give you a private tour of Bodice's little piece of hell. It did not take long for Uriel's eyes to adapt to the dull red glow of the afternoon. There was enough light to cast shadows from the small huts and dilapidated structures that surrounded their own, but these only served to darken the city further. It was barely brighter than the sewers, but enough for the angel to get an impression of his surroundings, his first real look at how humans lived in this hellish world, and what he saw brought him no joy. The street they were on ran to his left and right, branching off into smaller alleyways as it went. It was crammed with small, decrepit buildings and houses. Some of the residences were two stories tall, though most were little more than what could only be a room with four clay walls. Many of the places appeared to be abandoned. Broken windows and doors that barely clung to their hinges decorated a community of disrepair, but Uriel saw movement from the interiors every now and then. The conditions were bordering on inhospitable, if not completely so. The putrid scent of waste and rotting flesh were carried by the breeze, accompanied by the noise of arguing and the sounds of foot traffic. But the street they walked on as they ascended the hill barely showed signs of life. Those people that they did see were sure to keep their gazes low. Welcome to the slums. Chandra's voice was hushed. This is where all the homeless, the diseased, and the outcasts call their own. It's mostly humans here, even if they don't act like it. The only demons you see around these parts are the ones who come to act out their twisted pleasures. It is the closest the city gets to a true hell on earth, but it's the safest place for someone like me. Was, the archangel reminded. Now that they had found the other angels, sanctuary would be their refuge though Uriel knew that his companion was still unsure as to how safe she was surrounded by that many angels. We're going uphill, towards Bodice's palace. The other way leads to that asshole switchblade. Chandra spat on the ground. She ignored Uriel's reassurances of safety. Most of the slums appeared to be the same as they walked. It was only as they traveled farther up the hill, away from switchblade's territory, that things began to improve. The road widened and turned from dirt to stone. More and more people appeared on the streets, though they kept their heads down as they walked. Occasionally, a shuffling pair would bump into one another, usually resulting in the two silently carrying on their way. More than once, however, the archangel heard one of the humans swear at the other, who either walked away more quickly or swore right back. The half-demon and archangel never stuck around to find out how the confrontations ended. Tell me more about this human, Switchblade, Uriel implored, doing his best to take in the city while keeping his eyes low. It sounds like there is no love lost between you two. Astute observation, choir boy. Chandra smirked. Me and an old associate used to run with Switchblade and his gang. It was a good way to get by. Switchblade knew I was the best thief in the slums. Then his lieutenant, a demon, told him that I took something from him, and they tried to kill me, so I took someone from him. Uriel was stunned by the cold remarks. It reminded him that Chandra was only half-human, but also made him think about how cruel this world was. She did, not, she did not add anything more as she led the archangel through the slums, 
occasionally diverting through alleyways and side streets as if they were zeroing in on somewhere. They passed by a man who was offering drugs and a woman who was brandishing knives. Whether she was selling them or just showing them off was a mystery to the angel. A bright neon sign of a rose illuminated the front of a brothel. A handful of its workers, men and women, were out front, dressed in various outfits to appeal to all kinds of fetishes. Some of them enjoyed their profession. They enticed their clients with smiles and sweet words that appeared genuine to the archangel, but many of them exuded a sorrow so deep that it was almost tangible. They were broken, abused, and discarded by the world. Their forced smiles and makeup-covered bruises did not escape Uriel. The archangel's gaze returned to his feet when one of the women met his eyes, her sad gaze somehow finding his among the growing crowd. There was the vaguest semblance of life in those gray orbs, as if somewhere she still had hope. Uriel could not stand to look at them. The ground he walked on seemed to have suffered less. Don't you go getting any ideas, choir boy. Chandra nudged him with her elbow and snickered. God doesn't even know what they'll give you. Chandra clearly held no sympathy for the prostitutes, but Uriel wondered just how different she was from them, sneered at by society, a stain for those who knew of her true nature to turn their noses at or openly hate. Regardless, the Cambion was her usual dark, light-hearted self. It was not my intention, the archangel said softly, turning his gaze from the prostitutes. Chandra did not have a snide comment in response. She focused on putting one foot in front of the other, avoiding groups of people when she could. The Cambion was able to blend in without getting too close to anyone or anything. It was an art in itself, one that Uriel was grateful she was a master of. Without her lead, he would stick out like a sore thumb. Especially since, as they ascended the hill farther, the city began to change. Garbage and debris that littered the streets and blockaded alleys became sparser as buildings became taller, more solidly built. Beggars still lined the streets, though in fewer numbers than before. They asked for food and medicine mostly. One who was barefoot pleaded with a passerby for a simple pair of socks. People, while still sullen and keeping to themselves, were at least out in larger numbers now. There was a sufficient amount of living noise that Uriel was beginning to see how Zezerat was a functioning city. Suddenly, cutting through the buzz of the city, a cry of pain erupted from behind a house. It was far from the first call of distress the pair had heard, but it was the first that was close to them. The archangel quickened his pace, moving past his companion and guide. Chandra had to jog to catch up, barely able to put a hand on Uriel's shoulder before he turned into the alley, to the source of the scream. Don't. The Cambian's gaze was cold as ice and left no room for argument. You do not understand how difficult it is for me to stand by and do nothing, Uriel rebutted. In the alley, the archangel saw a man curled up on the ground as five other figures loomed over him. They were kicking the man and beating him with makeshift weapons. One assailant, a woman who could not have been more than two decades old, brought her foot down on the man's broken face. That is exactly what you're going to do, Chandra whispered harshly, her gaze now holding his own. I've used gaze a lot in this chapter. How many times do I have to tell you this? What the fuck do you think will happen? Will you just walk over there and cut them all down with your fire sword? Use a little angel magic to make their heads explode? Thank you, moron. Bodus doesn't know we're here. His demons have no idea we have two, two archangels in the city. It's our only advantage over him, and you can't afford to throw it away over the life of one man. The Cambion was right. Though he would not have killed the other humans, he could not afford to act now. Uriel took a deep, slow breath and nodded his assent. He knew the common belief was that angels were hardened, emotionless servants of God, but nothing could be further from the truth. Angels were connected to mankind, to the species in its entirety, on a level that neither divine entity nor mortal could explain. Chandra must have known this, having been raised by an angel herself. She must know that hearing the man's suffering echoed in his head and his heart. Angels were to cherish man above all else, above their father even. This world of anguish and horror only amplified the suffering that he felt biting at his subconscious. He knew Chandra was right. He could not break every time a human's life was in jeopardy. He isn't the first to die, Yuriel, and he definitely won't be the last. So let's get out of this shithole. There's still a lot of the city I need to show you. Yuriel flinched as he heard the sickening, wet crack of bone give way to another attack. Okay, let us be on our way then. The pair turned and walked past the alley, leaving the man to his fate. It could not have been more than half an hour of walking when the entire atmosphere of the city changed again. Suddenly, the angel and half-demon were swallowed by a large crowd of people. While many continued their silent shuffle, more and more were stopping in the middle of the street to chat with one another. He could hear numerous languages from the different conversations, even some humans who adopted the infernal tongue. The street had seamlessly changed from dirt to worn cobblestone and was bordered by all manners of stalls and stands where merchants sold and displayed their wares. The sheer number of people that filled the street market astonished the archangel. Since their vision had been blocked by the black clouds, Uriel and the rest of heaven believed mankind to be on the brink of extinction. 
But just by taking in his current surroundings, Uriel could tell that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of humans clustered in this small market, a market that must have counterparts in multiple cities across the planet. It did not cause his hopes to surge, however. The angel could see that not all the inhabitants of this city were human. A handful of hellish creatures walked among the crowd. They were not mere beasts from the pits of hell, but sentient beings that demanded respect and contempt. He could see a minotaur shoving its way through men and women, tossing those who did not move quickly enough. Every hundred meters or so contained at least one demon, its tall gray body standing well over a foot above the tallest human. Ghouls, shapeshifters in their natural forms and revenants were also among the throngs of beings, though in significantly fewer numbers. Keep your head to the ground and don't let anyone see that sword of yours, Chandra whispered to him. There are a lot of nasty bastards here and you don't look entirely human. Uriel took her advice and adjusted his cloak, making sure to obscure anything that might give him away as an angel. The cloak was loose enough to cover the golden grip of his sword without appearing awkward. Uriel was silently thankful for his luck. If they were found here, the odds would not be in their favor. It would not just be their element of surprise that was lost, but perhaps their lives. A lot of these humans are not feeling like themselves, you know? Some demons enjoy being in a meat suit just for fun, and you can't tell them apart. Well, maybe you can, but not without looking at their eyes. Uriel understood possession all too well. It was the only real advantage that a demon had compared to an angel. The beasts were able to project their consciousness into the mind of a human, taking complete control of all but the strongest willed. Using vessels that he and his brothers and sisters were sworn to serve was a cruel trick, but a devastatingly successful one. The demons could be cast out of the humans or, if an angel got within arm's reach, exercised and destroyed with a touch before their consciousness could leave the host. When the war between heaven and hell had just begun, Uriel watched as demons would possess humans in ranks numbering in the hundreds, sometimes even thousands. There were simply too many for the angels to save. The divine warriors had to cut down wave after wave of men, women, and children just to save themselves. The worst part of it all was that the demons were not killed if the host was. They would simply snap back to their own lupine bodies after their vessel had been slain. A possessed human was indistinguishable from any other, unless an angel looked for signs of the demons in their eyes. But if Uriel looked for them now, they would see the flicker in his own gaze that searched for the demon within. It was a dead giveaway. Can you possess people? The question jumped from Uriel's lips before he could even process what he was asking. He had never met a matured Cambion before. In fact, he had never even heard of angels allowing one to survive past infancy. Like many things in this new world, Cambions were a mystery to him. Chandra's step faltered, a hesitation barely noticeable to anyone who was not following her every move. No, she replied cautiously, not like they can. And she mulled over her words, as if trying to choose the appropriate one. I can't really control it. Hadriel meant to teach me, but that was before he was killed. I'd rather we didn't talk about that side of me, okay? Uriel did not press the point further, instead returning to their silent march through the crowded bazaar. Flanking them as they went were merchants who sold items he expected to see before the apocalypse. Jewelry, clothing, cookware, and basic amenities. The archangel did not see any signs of crops or produce, which he figured must be in short supply in this arid environment. Canned goods seemed to be the currency of choice, though the angel saw all manners of items being used to barter. Weapons were traded for medicine, trinkets for lighter fluids, and the like. Some stalls sold entirely different items, however, from the extraordinary to the macabre. One merchant boasted a variety of caged animals, creatures from the shadows and beasts from the depths of hell. A giant spider struggled frantically to escape its enclosure, while a four-legged wind creature tried in vain to snatch at the arachnid with its talons. The merchant herself had something coiled around her arm. At first glance, Uriel believed it to be a pair of serpents, twins perhaps. Upon closer inspection, the angel discovered that the two snake heads were joined together farther down their serpentine body. Each head seemed to hiss and snap at its own targets as they walked by. Both heads, however, fixated on Uriel as the pair passed the strange stall. Damn it, the Cambion muttered. She ushered the archangel along faster. Uriel did not need much prompting. He knew that most infernal beasts had an instinctual lust for the blood and flesh of angels. No spell or rune or stench from the sewers could hide that completely. The Beastmaster turned to look at the two companions as they shuffled away from her and her pets. Luckily for the pair, her attention was stolen as an argument broke out on the other side of the street. From what Uriel could hear, a man decided that his tin of peaches was worth more than what he had received for them, and was threatening the shopkeeper. Uriel slowed his pace when he noticed the shadows behind the merchant shift ever so subtly. Without so much as a whisper, the disgruntled customer's head was pulled back by his hair and a knife glinted as it opened up his throat. Uriel barely even saw as the silent assassin, dressed in the same faded black cloak as everyone else, sheathed their blade and melted back into the darkness. 
Whether it was human or something else, the angel did not know, but it was disturbingly adept at killing. What happened next, however, shook the angel even more. People swarmed the man as his lifeblood spilled onto the cobblestone walkway and began looting his warm corpse, but they were not what chilled Uriel to his bones. Within seconds, the scavengers had grabbed everything they could and then scattered as a giant of a man pushed his way over to the scene. The man, if that's truly what it was, wore a leather mask with a disfigured face painted on it. The mask itself appeared to be bolted to the man's head, the nails rusted from age and weather. His bare arms were easily twice the size of Uriel's, if not more, and the angel's head might have reached the man's shoulders. No one willingly stood in the terrifying figure's way, while those who did not move in time were knocked aside. When the man reached the corpse, he merely bent down and picked it clear off the ground with one hand. After throwing it over his shoulder, he, or it, turned and brought the corpse back to one of the stalls. It was only as the giant laid the body on a table and another man began hacking away at it that the archangel realized the stall dealt exclusively in grotesque wares. Heads that were still frozen in ghastly expressions hung from the sign that just read, Meat. Ribs that had once housed a human heart sat on the counter next to steaks that Uriel assumed did not come from livestock. That is enough, the archangel muttered as he turned away. Is there anywhere else you should show me before the light disappears? Just one, Chandra replied, leading the way through the crowd. How quickly they recovered from the ordeal shocked and saddened Uriel. It is important, though. The Cambion led him down a maze of side alleys, winding passages that were walled in by decrepit buildings. Uriel barely noticed the now normal sightings of the homeless, diseased, and scared. Rats and other scavengers rustled in piles of trash and picked at rotting corpses. The city was a cesspool. Chandra brought him to a wall that appeared to be made of the same glossy stone that surrounded the city. It was smooth, sheer ebony rock that was warm to the touch. The myriad of hovels and run-down houses came close to the wall, but never seemed to touch it, as if their disheveled status was repelled by its perfection. Except for one small structure, a crudely constructed shelter that was barely as tall as Uriel. Its roof sloped upwards, eventually coming to rest against the black wall. Chandra looked in all directions to make sure no eyes were on them before opening the door and pulling Uriel inside. This wall separates the rich from the poor and the demons from everyone else. On the other side are the highest ranking bastards of Oda's commands, and they like to think they're kings. You can't get in through any of the main roads, they're all guarded at the gates by demons and humans. Luckily, I found this crack. Some acquaintances and I covered it up so the demons wouldn't find it. Not like they'd come this deep into the housing blocks anyway. When they do lower themselves to our standards, they keep to the markets or the brothels. Uriel's eyes adjusted to the darkness of the hut. He felt a warm breeze against his face in the cramped interior and realized that the ramshackle building hit a large crack in the wall. The Cambian turned and slid through the jagged fissure, her small frame able to make it through without much effort. Uriel could not see the other side of the hole in the wall, but he had to trust his companion. He turned sideways, adjusted his sword, and held it parallel to his body. The archangel had to hold his breath and squeeze through the rock to follow the half-demon, but he managed to shuffle after her. His eyes began to see the faint glow of the world, its red-tinged light barely able to light the passage's end. The wall had to be at least twice as thick as Uriel was tall, perhaps even more. The archangel, feeling the density of the rock all around him, wondered what could have caused such a large crack in it. He counted himself lucky, though, that something had. Seconds later, the archangel was shimmying out the other side of the wall, stumbling into a row of hedges. The plants were lush and green, thick enough to hold the angel up as he tried to regain his footing. The flora ran parallel to the wall in each direction, providing an effective cover for the pair in their secret entrance. Chandra pulled on his arm once again, all but dragging him through the section of brush that was not as full as the rest. I used to sneak in here and break into the houses, Chandra said, spinning in a low circle while she regarded the towering buildings all around her. Uriel took in their surroundings too, astonished at how different the world of demons was from that of the humans just beyond the wall. The ground was covered in smooth, interlocking stones that created even roads, a far cry from the dirt and worn cobble that existed in the slums. Massive houses, three or four stories each, were constructed at even intervals. Most of them were made from the same material as the wall they had just passed through, but the dark rock only served to make the scene more beautiful. Fountains adorned some intersections along the many paths that they could see, while more plants, trees and flowers mostly, added some splashes of life and color. Uriel had seen this kind of grandiose architecture before, echoes of how lavishly the most powerful humans chose to live throughout their history. It seemed that the demons had a penchant for that style too. They always had the best things, Chandra said, and Uriel thought he may have missed something the Cambian had told him, so awestruck by the radical change in the city. Come on then, I have to show you something. The Cambian began walking down one of the many ornate paths. 
The houses all had the same style and design, but each had a unique feature unto itself. One had an elegant garden in front of it, another two had towering spires on either side. It took the archangel conscious effort to remember that this district of the city belonged to demons. I've never seen demons live like this before. Uriel knew it was a foolish statement. The control that demons had on the planet was unprecedented. The dogs have a human fetish. Chandra spat on the ground as if the words were poison. The more powerful they get, the more time they want to spend in a meat suit. Most of these perverts around here never stop possessing people. They have slaves that they alternate through, damaging and abusing one body until it's about to die, and then moving on to the next as it recovers. They like to pretend they are human, the cambion motioned all around her with her arms, thus all the houses and flowers and crap. And where do they hide themselves when they are possessing people for so long? Uriel knew that a demon was weakest when it was possessing someone. Without its consciousness, its body was just an empty and vulnerable shell. Do they have dens? Despite being sentient, demons were still animalistic in nature. They traveled in packs like the canines that most of them resembled. It might have been this pack instinct that led them to create dens whenever they possessed humans. A safe location, usually underground, where the beasts would congregate to possess as a group. They needed a place to protect their physical forms, so they hid together. Uriel and other angels found out far too often, however, that some would only fake their slumber, waiting for an angel to be blinded by the prospect of such easy prey. For the most part, though, dens were a welcome find for any warrior of heaven. They are everywhere, Chandra replied, usually in the basement of some of the houses. Bodas has one in his palace as well. That's where his guards sleep. The angel nodded in understanding. Where is the demon's palace? Hold on, the Cambian said, rolling her eyes. You aren't even going to ask me how I know that? Well, I assume I gave you this kick-ass piece of information like that, and you don't even wonder about it? I'm sorry, Uriel said, confused as to where this outburst came from. He never understood humans, or anything that was half-human for that matter. How did you get this information? No, fuck it, it's over now. Chandra seemed disappointed, but was smiling at the same time. Let's go, choir boy. The perplexed angel opened his mouth to apologize again, but decided against it as the Cambian moved away from him. Yet another thing he noted that he would have to get used to in this world. The pair walked for a bit more, but the sun's glow was quickly fading. All the while, Uriel wondered whether Chandra was truly upset with him. His mind was pulled elsewhere as the Cambian led him around yet another corner onto yet another street adorned with symbols of wealth and power. It was not the houses or the statues or the gleaming gates that drew Uriel's attention, though, but the imposing silhouette of the dark palace that loomed above them. It was difficult to make out the exact features as the day's light was quickly diminishing, though the sheer size of the palace and its towers were enough to tell Uriel exactly where he would find the snake, Bodus. Still, it was not enough to make the Archangel think that the demon stood any chance against him. Emboldened, the Archangel increased his pace down the street. He wanted to gather as much intelligence as he could, so he could sever the head of the serpent without delay. Hold up, Chandra said, her arm moving to block Uriel's path. See up there? Uriel followed her gaze about a kilometer or so ahead to a gate, barely visible as the street curved away, that lay flush in yet another wall of black stone. At the threshold were ten figures, eight demons wandering on the ground and two humans on top of the wall. The demons were holding various types of bladed weapons, modified to work with their elongated limbs and fingers, but the humans were holding something else. Guns. Uriel was reminded once again of the danger that this world posed to angels, even to an archangel. He remembered watching from heaven as man created the first weapon capable of firing hundreds of bullets per minute. Not even an angel could survive such an assault. The two on top of the wall are possessed and each of them has a rifle. They could probably hit us from here, Chandra explained as she moved back behind the closest house. Uriel followed suit. We will need those weapons, the angel said resolutely. Yeah, good luck getting anywhere near them. If they don't blow your brains out right away, the other ones might give them the time to try again. Chandra was right. With his limited abilities, the archangel would be hard-pressed to take down that many demons, especially while the sights of those rifles were aimed at him. Even if he did manage to defeat the demons on the ground and not be torn apart by gunfire, the demons possessing the sharpshooters would just snap back to their own bodies. The whole city would be aware of his presence. Maybe when there are more of us, Uriel said with some resignation. He glanced towards the sky. The angel was still not entirely sure of the night and day cycles on this new earth, but he could tell that the sky was getting darker, and he wanted to be back with the others before nightfall. The city's inhabitants were vile enough during the day. He did not wish to see what the dark of night brought with it. I think we should head back now. I was just going to say the same thing, Chandra agreed, turning on her heels. You've seen the snake's palace. Tomorrow we'll figure out how to get in there. With a nod, the pair began walking back towards the passage in the wall. They had walked for only a few moments when Uriel noticed movement ahead, 
something that was completely out of place in the empty streets of the upper district. Two figures rounded the corner at the next intersection of the roads. Chandra noticed it too and shoved the angel down a path to their side. She pushed him against the wall of one of the houses and then peeked around the corner. Shit, she cursed. They're coming this way. You don't want to be a half-demon in this part of the city, and you sure as fuck don't want to be an angel. She turned to move down the path they were on, but her heart sank when she realized it was not a path at all, just a grand walkway to the back of one of the houses. No more than ten meters in front of them was an iron door. The wall of the next house created the illusion of an alley. If that door was locked, both the angel and Cambian knew that they were trapped. Chandra pushed past the archangel and tried the door's handle. It did not move. Uriel was beside her in a flash and tried it himself, driving his shoulder into the door at the same time. Even with his inhuman strength, the door did not so much as shudder. He could see Chandra's body tense as she started to panic. Shit, shit, shit. Chandra was pacing back and forth. She stopped to listen. Both of them could hear that whoever was approaching was about to come into view. Do exactly as I say. The half-demon moved next to the archangel and flattened herself against the wall. She gripped Uriel's shoulders and moved him in front of her, the space between them reduced to almost nothing. Uriel did not know what she planned, but his muscles tensed. I can't believe I have to do this. Kiss me. Uriel was confused by the command. Kiss me now and don't stop until I do. The archangel hesitated. Angels were not sexual creatures by nature. In all his millennia of existence, Uriel had never truly kissed another being, much less a half-demon. He did not have time to think as Chandra pulled him into her, her lips meeting his. Suddenly, all of Uriel's doubts were gone. The angel could not find the words to describe what it was he felt, but he kissed her and found his hands tracing along her spine. Careful, Uriel heard a voice shout from the path. You don't know what the demon looks like on the other side of that bitch. The remark was met with laughter from a handful of different voices, much more than the original two that Uriel had thought were on the street. Soon, the voices faded as the group passed them by. Chandra gently pushed the angel back to arm's reach. She did not make eye contact with him, but turned and walked away in silence. Uriel followed her, relying on the Cambian to get back to the sewer entrance. He found himself dumbfounded. No thought could form itself in his head. He did not know what to say to Chandra, so he walked a few paces behind her the rest of the way, which was okay with the Cambian. She could not hide her smile the entire walk back. Okay, and so ends chapter 7, which has to be one of my favorite chapters. I feel like I say that after every chapter lately, but it's, there's a lot of world building going on, and we find out a lot about the earth that Uriel has come down to and how it's changed substantially from what we're used to. We see sickness and disease more so than we saw uh, two chapters ago. We see how the world actually operates. We saw the nasty stuff going on at the market, which has to be, again, one of my favorite parts. Um, but it's a very important part because the rest of the story, or the majority of it, takes place within Zezerat, and we really need the lay of the land and to understand what's going on. We're just as lost in terms of understanding this world as Uriel is. And overall, just a great world-building chapter, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed writing and reading it. Uh, once again, if you want to get a free ebook of Archangel, I am giving them out just so you can stay at home and read it instead of going outside and potentially spreading this disease or this virus more. So check out the first link in the description down below. If you aren't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel so you can check out all the other chapters that we'll be reading through. And we actually have a lot of book reviews coming up. So if you're interested in book reviews for some urban fantasy, dark fantasy, some horror, uh, some cosmic horror we're getting in there, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Drop a like if you enjoyed the video. And until next time, take care. Be safe.